please introduce our second speaker, that's Mr. Sanjay Mantri, a consultant ophthalmologist with the Tennant Institute in Glasgow. He works at Garth Naval General Hospital and also at Hill Hospitals. He's also had experience down in the Birmingham area. Many of come up from there. You may have heard him at a group meeting down there before he moved north to Scotland. Um, a specialist interest is in corneas and refractive surgery. He's also an examiner for the Fellowship Exam for Ophthalmologists in Glasgow and has published many articles. So I'm sure if you go on the website, you'll find some of the articles that he's published. So welcome, Mr. Sanji Mantri. Thanks very much uh, for your kind words and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I have to apologize at the outset that I um, won't be able to stay for the afternoon uh, panel bit. So I think to we'll make it interactive, please uh, stop and ask me questions and I think that's probably the best way and I'll stay till lunch uh, if there was any questions you want to ask me. Um, as I was asked, um, I think um, I'm just going through really the epidemiology, just, just the common things that cross through your mind if you're diagnosed with keratoconus. Um, and uh, the possible management that's available, including the management that's all available in Glasgow for all of us here in Scotland, really. Um, <coughs> um, keratoconus, all, all of us know, it's um, uh, a non-inflammatory uh, bilateral, pro bilateral progressive disease. Um, it is slowly progressive, and, and hence it could be monitored um, qu quite uh, well, and uh, you, you could, you, you actually, it's, it's not very rapidly progressive, fortunately, unless the presentation is very, very uh, advanced during presentation. Um, in terms of incidence, uh, it would be, um, th th there are a few published articles, and um, on the whole, um, it's quoted as one in 2000. Um, fortunately, uh, the risks for um, uh, in the family is less, but less than one in ten chance. Though there is stronger family history, uh, if, if you do have a family history, there's more chance of you having keratoconus. It's not as much as glaucoma, but keratoconus there is chance as well. <coughs> um, first thing, uh, I suppose anyone um, gets asked if, if they present uh, for the first time, uh, being referred by the optometrist, saying you you have change in refraction. We query keratoconus, and the first thing I get asked is how will it progress? How um, that is one thing which is very very difficult uh, to predict. Um, the onset usually is between 12 to 20 years of age, but the people born um, born with keratoconus and it's been diagnosed as late as 51 years of age. Um, the the good thing is 80 percent of them, um, or 80% or of people diagnosed with keratoconus will not require corneal graft. So it's only 20% who will require corneal <coughs> graft. So that's, that's one important thing. So uh, corneal graft is slightly on the uh, uh, less common side, but um, anyone who's advanced keratoconus will need corneal transplant. In my experience, um, but the more they advance the presentation, uh, which, which goes by your keratometric finding, um, finding of clinical signs, the more likely they progress towards intervention and they're very difficult to manage with contact lenses. And I think that's, that does give me an idea as to who would need coronary transplant. So somebody who's 14 year old uh, comes with moderate keratoconus. Um, normally, uh, in, in the general scheme of things, I would say the eye grows to near 30 years of age and there's about sort of 14 years left. Uh, most of them will need some sort of intervention. Um, but uh, with, with the advent of very, very good um, RGP stereo contact lenses and the variety of contact lenses which you've just been alluded to, uh, things are definitely uh, getting less interventional. But um, the more steep you are in the presentation, the earlier age, it, uh, you are, the more likely you may need a corneal transplant. Uh, Stephen Tuff from Morfids did uh, quite a, a big longitudinal study. Uh, it's 21% again uh, needed uh, corneal transplant uh, within 
uh, eight point eight years of mean seven years of uh, the diagnosis. Very difficult etiology. Um, I think um, there's lots of. Uh, I think if you can't find a simple cause, then there's hundreds and thousands of hypotheses, and uh, there is hypothesis that uh, uh, obviously there's. Um, Tear film uh, comes into play, the enzymes, uh, reactive uh, chemicals, um, uh, the availability of uh, nitric oxide and free radicals, which damage the cornea, uh, comes into play and has been um, hypothesized as causing keratoconus. One of the most recent review articles that you see in a cornea journal has, have you ever heard of char? Anyone? It's um, nothing to do with burning. It's a chronic habit of abnormal rubbing. Uh, but this is a, a big review article. They've looked into everything into detail uh, about a strong association. And one of the so commonest question I a first question I would ask is um, anyone who's got keratoconus, if you look back, either there's a history of asthma, eczema, or habit of rubbing. And I think Though you can't say it's 100%, and though you can't put it straight away, but this, that's why there's lots of uh, histopathological study being done of anyone who has a corneal transplant looking into their corneas and looking at uh, their habits and um, the changes. Um, uh, this, this particular review article, which is actually a, a five-page article, goes into total detail about how they hypothesize a chronic um, 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 habit of abnormal rubbing can cause uh, uh, closing the eyes, cause um, you have increased temperature uh, because of lack of evaporation. That increases inflammatory mediators. It can cause slippage of the collagen fibrils, and uh, that's what is being utilized, and the collagen thinning and the, um, uh, the slippage being utilized in the newer treatments. Um, and this almost fourfold increase in interleukin um, uh, um, in, in the keratocytes due to mechanical trauma. And there's lots of things that um, th th this uh, particular uh, um, article describes as to how um, chronic habit of abnormal uh, rubbing can cause change in tissue pressure, uh, causing biomechanically coupled uh, coverage of change in the um, cone apex. Um, just to show um, how mechanical a pressure can cause a gradual um, um, uh, area of, of thinning. Now, a strong association, um, all of you know, um, uh, the common ones are atopic disease. Uh, it has a very, very commonly associated with Down's syndrome, uh, connective tissue disorders, and IRA being, as I was just saying, 66% in one series and 73% in another series. Uh, there are retinal conditions as well which can come with us, uh, mainly vapors, uh, optic neuropathy, which is fortunately very com uncommon. This has all been uh, um, uh, sort of, you know, this, we've all been through it, but I think the earliest um, symptom one gets referred is frequent changes of glasses or contact lenses or early distortion of reflex or somebody complaining of monocular diplopia ghosting is the first time you get picked up and um, clinical findings to go with it um, uh, there, there are quite a few uh, new um, um, uh, video keratography which, which diagnose it very early um, uh, uh, um, association with eye rubbing and things does give you a clue that it may be early keratoconus um, Gray, I'm sure you've just um, been through it, and I'm sorry if it's a repetition, but I thought it's a wider audience, people who've attended before and people who've not attended before, so I thought it's a good uh, way to just introduce you. Um, basically, mild keratoconus is somebody, um, I I in a normal situation, um, this video keratography, which is basically a corneal mapping, uh, will show like a bow tie appearance, and here, what, what you what you're being shown, is, is very asymmetrical, like a teardrop sign, and this is the start of an early keratoconus, where it's not behaving like a, um, it, it's not like a symmetrical bow tie, it's like a teardrop sign. And 
um, on retinoscopy, you, you'll find, um, or basically, for, from patient, uh, from your point of view, you will actually find uh, that it's basically more ghosting or early, uh, quite significant change in the glasses that's first identified. Um, later on, um, the other clinical signs come into play, uh, like enlarged corneal nerves, fleshless ring. Um, but uh, more, most importantly, it's more on um, the keratographic picture, where uh, the uh, keratometer readings are between 45 and 52. These at presentation are the ones who definitely will need contact lenses. They, 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 they won't struggle with good quality of vision with glasses. Um, and this is probably the stage now, we would say, uh, that contact lenses, if contact lenses is intolerant, I would think of intax as, as, a, as, a, as a good uh, um, area in moderate care to and the response and, and the results are much better at this stage. Advanced care to um, more than 52 as you can see, it's quite advanced. Uh, you can see all the clinical signs, vision acuity, almost less than 624 to 636. You start getting signs of scarring and because the thinning is significant, you can get uh, rupture of the back layer called desmus membrane and you can uh, get fluid through the aqueous or, or inside the eye and you can get something called high drops and that is obviously leads to scarring and further deterioration of vision. Um, just uh, the, the techniques we use to uh, diagnose um, is op scan, it's like a video cartography, just to do corneal mapping and the problem is sometimes you can actually have a symptom. Um, I've been referred quite a few uh, patients who definitely complain of ghosting. You see uh, just a placebo disc image and there's nothing to see. But um, these newer ones, OpScan has been there for a long time, but basically uh, it shows the back, back float of the, of the cornea as well. And sometimes you can get something called posterior keratoconus which you will not identify with just a placido disc and hence picks up very early on and as um, uh, Don was alluding to uh, that's one of the easiest thing to pick up in somebody who's got myopia but no signs of keratoconus uh, and who's somebody asking for refractive surgery but if you've got a hot spot or a red spot like this uh, on the on the back float you you are uh, the diagnosis is keratoconus form first day as in in making if you have laser surgery that's your keratoconus full blown so one big big no for effective surgery is uh, is uh, keratoconus and i think that that's probably uh, one of the most important tests to do anyone who has myopia or short-sightedness uh, and wants refractive surgery newer development now is something called Oculus Penticam, which uses Sanflut uh, camera and uses very, very uh, sensitive uh, pictures. Um, uh, this, uh, this gives you various printouts, but it gives you very, very good quality uh, as to where the elevation is and uh, picks up very sensitively. Um, and uh, this is now, um, uh, I wouldn't be wrong in saying this, topographic guided contact lenses come into play, which is which in some people is very successful as well. Um, science, um, Stone's gone through. Basically, I think um, uh, you, you can see a scarring here um, protruding. Um, you always see like Munson sign and large corneal nerves, uh, oil droplet sign. I think these are something which I'm sure all of you are aware of, but um, it, it really doesn't, from, from your point of view, that's not what is important. The important is what would you do to prevent this? I think, unfortunately, there, is, there isn't, once you're diagnosed with keratoconus, there isn't much you can do in terms of wearing contact lenses to prevent it getting worse, or um, uh, the, the only thing uh, is uh, avoiding the coexistence. So if you had asthma, eczema, um, habit of rubbing, that's the only thing which can prevent it getting worse, but nothing else, unfortunately, which is easy for, it, for, for uh, the, the natural process to change. Um, that's um, the extreme form where you can have rupture of the desmus membrane and the fluid accumulates in the cornea and the cornea can go as cloudy as that and then into with scarring. 
and it's called keratoconus induced hydrops. <coughs> um, a very, very um, atypical variation of it is uh, uh, keratoglobus, where you can have not a localized area of thinning, quite significantly um, thin all across. Um, so you don't have flesh string, you have a big uh, thin uh, cornea from um, periphery to periphery. Um, treatments, I think uh, I would just touch on a few of them uh, because we've got speaker uh, later on this afternoon who will go through a few bits of it as well. Uh, but I think I would uh, like to share a video with you. Um, but if you won't feel comfortable, please let me know and I'll stop it. Um, I think um, rigid gas membrane contact lens is probably uh, uh, the one which has just been covered. Collagen cross-linking, unfortunately at the moment, is not NICE guidelines approved. Um, NICE guidelines or sign guidelines would say it's experimental at the moment. I'm trying my bit to get it at Gart Naval, but it's not easy at the moment. So unfortunately it's only available privately. Um, and if you go to the insurance companies as well, they say easy to get out is experimental treatment, so hence. But there's, there's a lot of data and lots of publications suggesting somebody who uh, really, I, from my point of view, um, as you were just saying about the epithelium bit, um, from my point of view, if you can do a very, very small um, um, uh, procedure, and um, even if it doesn't do a whole lot of good, it, if it prevents you uh, to go for a graft, just because you are getting to a uh, thin cornea and you can have a collagen cross-linking with intacts, and then avoid, and then go back to the contact lens and avoid a corneal graft. I think that's a big achievement, actually. So I, from, from my personal point of view, I think that's a very good step. But I think, as everything, it, it will take some time to come in the National Health Service, though we do have intacts available now. Can you maybe explain intact? I don't remember. Uh -huh. I was. Are you going to go through? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to go through a bit. Um, though I know that uh, uh, Sadish Srinivasan, um, uh, the uh, he, he will go through a bit more in detail. Um, collagen cross-linking is basically you've got a weaker area. You take the epithelium off. So basically, taking the epithelium off as if you've got a scratch, but it's just taken a bit more controlled way. You can use 20% alcohol to take the skin off. Uh, the epithelium comes out of, uh, as a sheet. You use riboflavin uh, drops every five minutes, and basically um, you expose the eye to ultraviolet A light uh, with 370 nanometer. And that's shown, it was about five years ago, they did it in rabbit eyes and saw how um, that thin collagen area got rigid and the spacing, as you can see on the right eye, uh, showed um, the schematically, uh, it gets thickened and uh, helps um, that way. Though, in some people it's useful, some people it's not. We have people in the audience, and I can see one. Uh, in, in some people it's helped, in some people it, it hasn't. Um, but certainly, it is very, very small compared to if you think about what's involved in corneal graft surgery and how long and lifelong risk of ejection. So that's definitely a much, much more interventional thing. Um, that's the procedure. Basically, uh, as you can see, the yellow area uh, is basically the skin has been taken off and the riboflavin drops, which is yellow. Uh, that's how it looks like. It's an outpatient procedure. Uh, it is painful for that particular evening, but after that, the, uh, and the epithelium heals in about 24 hours. More than... <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Uh, everybody individually is different, but um, I, I suppose we do a lot of corneal procedures and usually I would say the uh, epithelium will heal in 24 hours and uh, everybody's potentially different. Um, it, it has shown uh, to decrease significant amount of astigmatism and helps uh, strengthening the cornea, that's, that's the claim. Uh, but I think it's a good adjunct uh, uh, with contact lenses for, for the management. There's, there's been lots of studies now showing uh, its uh, sort of safety uh, to stroma, endothelium, lenses, which was the major concern when it was started. 
Um, and it could be combined with Intax, as I was saying. Basically, Intax is uh, using um, uh, PMMA rings to flatten the area which is uh, protruding like a cone in simple step. But that's going to be explained in, uh, or, or uh, explained in detail a bit later on. But these are something which is now available um, readily, and fortunately, Intax is available at Cartmere. Now, corneal transplants, um, we, we know uh, that the traditional two uh, transplants, I think, we've all been, um, if you've been to any keratoconus conference, I'm sure you've been uh, told that the penetrating keratoplasty, which is full thickness corneal transplant, has been there, it's a gold standard, and has been there for a long time. Uh, the recent four or five years, we, we saw, uh, saw the rejuvenation of lamellar keratoplasty, which I'll slightly go into uh, detail and show you some videos. Fortunately, 10 to 20 percent of people will need corneal transplant. Um, <coughs> uh, more and more, the contact lenses are getting better, and hence, less people need corneal transplant. If I was going to do a corneal transplant, um, the, the thing in theatre that I would do is I would usually go for an age match donor cornea, inspect their endothelial count because you could potentially do a, a corneal transplant which is full thickness, and you screen for all infection that's done by the bank. You, um, the, the principle is the area of weak cornea is taken off uh, by a, 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 a trifine, a round trifine, which is about 8 millimeters diameter and uh, the donor cornea is placed into place by either 16 interrupted suture or a continuous suture. That's the basic principle. As I said, full thickness corneal transplant, everybody's comfortable because we've got long-term results, very, very good outcome, and it's been there for a long time. So still there is a role for uh, uh, penetrating keratoplasty if you've had very advanced keratoconus, very, very deep scarring, there's been perforation, and some, some people do better in terms of their refractive outcome with uh, penetrating keratoplasty even now. <coughs> the one which is uh, significantly changed for keratoconus in the last five years is the lamellar keratoplasty. And I think one of the main reasons for changing was because the endothelium is normal. The main reason for endothelial um, uh, corneal graft rejection it starts from immune site in uh, the endothelium. So your immune basis starts from the endothelium and that's the main cause of rejection. So if you've got a normal endothelium, why replace it? And hence the drive to do a partial thickness graft came into keratoconus. Um, if you had vascularized cornea because of contact lens overwear or contact lens you've been wearing for 20 years, uh, people do have, or if there's history of eczema, asthma, which is very, very normal, uh, can cause a uh, lot of atopy. So <coughs> lamellar grafts do better than, than penetrating keratoplasty in that. Um, you're not entering the eye as such, um, uh, so you avoid intraocular complications with that. And more and more, we're getting more specialized where you can just do, if your back layer is abnormal, that's the endothelium is abnormal, uh, you can just selectively do endothelial transplant. So you can use the, the two grafts for, for, from the same donor, you could use for two, two people now. Uh, so donor endothelial count and, and the endothelium is not important. So hence, there are more donor tissue which could be used in the future and a shorter recovery. This is one of the example uh, which I always give for uh, promoting the melacaritoplasty. This is somebody who's had corneal transplant, full thickness corneal transplant for about 20 years, came to Moffitt Eye Hospital with a uh, pterygium, uh, a pseudo pterygium coming and caused the graft of the hips, um, basically showing that not even a trauma, uh, a full thickness graft never heals because um, it, it, it is the edge um, and uh, it never heals. So, Hence, there was more drive or more reason to doing a partial thickness graft where you're not entering the eye as such. Lamellar keratoplasty is not new. It's been there for a long time, but it never um, took up popularity because microsurgical techniques and the instrumentation wasn't available. 
but it's been rejuvenated in the last few years uh, with um, in 1985 and uh, 1994 when uh, Arkea and Sovieta they they proposed and they showed their results. Some people use the uh, partial thickness um, um, uh, surgery by using uh, air. Some people use um, uh, cell line, and some people use air in the anterior chamber to visualize um, um, the uh, endothelium uh, and use use the plane. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. I use the Meles technique for uh, the identifying uh, the uh, endothelium uh, or or decimus membrane, and uh, uh, it basically uh, allows me to do a very good partial thickness graft and retain the decimus membrane and the endothelium. Now, um, my experience, we've done about 75 consecutive uh, ISN-60 patients uh, over the last five, six years, and uh, the preponderance of male was more. Um, the first bit was in Birmingham uh, and followed up by here. Um, I, is there anyone who's got problems with video? Or should I leave it? So um, basically there is air in anterior chamber and I'm using this lamellar dissector to actually um, do a partial thickness graft. That's the entry point. So it's not full thickness graft. I'm almost literally creating a pocket all throughout using this and air in entry chamber uh, to um, achieve a partial thickness dissection. Um, so you will see uh, that all around, uh, first of all, this bit is, is marked on the surface, uh, saying how much uh, a coronal um, a diameter you would want to take. Usually it's typically 7.75 .7 to 8 millimeters. And you do this, and then when you've dissected this, take the air out of the anterior chamber, take the, uh, take the anterior button, the front button away, leave the back layer on. Right, okay, this, after this bit, when taking the cornea off, may not be the best one to show, so I'll try and see if I can forward this. Um, so, this does look, uh, I must say, after this technique, uh, because of the various work done by uh, lots of people, this, this is particular device by Garrett Mellis, who's a, a Dutch ophthalmologist. So that's the uh, air in the entry chamber being taken off, and that I'm creating, I'm using a viscoelastic to uh, separate the front layer from the back layer. You want to keep the back layer, that's your own layer, and take the front tissue away and replace it with a partial thickness uh, donor cornea. Um, I think taking the cornea off may not appeal to you. Right, so um, to be honest, uh, that in a way has been revolutionary uh, because uh, a partial thickness graft uh, has quite a lot of advantages and though it was all in, in the idea before, we could never achieve that good dissection. Now because of the variety of techniques uh, used, some people use Anwar's technique, some people use Malice technique, they do dissection and uh, the results are much, much better. And for long term, because you've not replaced the endothelium, the, uh, the, the graft survival is better. Um, just uh, some audit results, basically the uh, age group was 16 to 68, mean age being 36 in my group of adult patients. Uh, Pre-op vision, um, about 85% were less than 6 by 36. Um, fortunately, all 100% improve. Um, if you excluded all um, associated um, a, any macular change or any other uh, cataract change, um, about 90% achieved greater than 6-9, which is driving low vision, with or without glasses, with or without contact lenses. Uh, refractive outcome, as you would expect, uh, was largely myopic. Um, the uh, astigmatism was uh, fairly okay. You'd want it less than 2, but 
and that, that was fairly okay. The range was from 1.5 to 4.5. So I think uh, that way laminar keratoplasty has been really, really good. Um, but still there is role for penetrating keratoplasty for advanced uh, keratoconus. People with very, very deep scarring where you could perforate while you're doing um, the dissection. Uh, and it's not free from complication. It has its own problems. Uh, but fortunately, I think um, if it is my eyes and if I had to uh, um, have a, um, a graft for, uh, for a coronary transplant, I would prefer to have a, a partial thickness graft if uh, all the parameters were within um, range. Um, there are two um, grafts I've not talked about which is not related to keratoconus and I think there was a few questions going around about uh, endothelial transplant and uh, stem cell transplant. Now, stem cell transplant not uh, really uh, important in terms of um, keratoconus because it's more for people who have uh, stem cell loss as a result of chemical injury or previous uh, problems, or they have ocular surface inflammation, and really, it's it's for them the stem cell research has uh, uh, changed a lot of treatment, and the. Uh, there are two main indications we do coronal transplant if you ask the first lie bank. Keratoconus is the commonest condition which the two grafts have described. The other one is a Fuchs endothelial district which is mainly the endothelium problem and that one has now changed significantly with the endothelial um, uh, transplant, just, just selective endothelial trans uh, transplant called DSEC. And fortunately that's all available here in Scotland. Follow up. Um, oh. Is that, right. Can I have some any questions at all? <laughs> <laughs> contraindicator for cross-linking. Are there any others? For example, is severe dry eye a contraindicator? For cross-linking? Yes. Uh, I would have thought so because um, the collagen cross-linking is really an adjuvant therapy and uh, uh, corneal thickness, I was, I was mentioning that I think if it's less than 350 then there's risk of endothelial damage or um, that, but otherwise collagen uh, cross-linking, no, I, I wouldn't say dry eye is a big contraindication unless it's bone dry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that's a contraindication as such. Do you think that would be approved for the NHS soon or is this private? I, I, it's, I, I don't think it's an easy one uh, because problem is unless the MICE guidelines or the SIGN guidelines approve it, I don't think uh, it's easy to get it in the NHS. Uh, but on the other hand, I think if we, the, 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 the sort of surgeons in, in National Health Service, if we drive it just saying, if we believe in it, why won't? So fr from our point of view, we just put in uh, the business case through. But I think the, the, the rules are at the moment, anything which is nice or sign approved, other ones should be available. They, they're not, they, they, they can't uh, justify having everything. And that's the problem. I can't see that having in the next year or so. Can, can I give you a it's, it's very variable, but, uh, about a thousand pounds per eye, but I think it's very variable actually, because I think it depends on who's doing it and how it's done and, you know, if you've got a set up and things like that, but yeah, it is and something. Like yes, uh, you, you will get a lot more information as well. Um, Mr. Srinivasan can just speak about that this afternoon as well. That's a session on that. Is there about, like, Surgeons putting pressure on the NICE guidelines and everything else. But I know from other pressure groups, especially when it came to the NICE guidelines on self injury, NICE guidelines on attention deficit disorder, the lobby groups from service users and their families was able to put more pressure on and to get things passed quicker. Is that possible within this year? Oh, without a doubt. I think that's the, that's the best way we can get things done. But um, unfortunately, uh, here in Scotland, I particularly feel, feel that. There's a lot of people who can, um, um, you know, if, even if the wait is something like a year, I don't think people come up with that. And I think it, it's to do with 
the patients writing to uh, the consultant and the management, and I think that's that's the biggest pressure actually. That would change everything. Uh, let aside a sign guideline or nice guideline, without a doubt, that's the main force actually, without a doubt. So I think it, it, it will be uh, available locally a bit quicker or earlier if if people as a group wrote just saying if it's available, if it's useful, why not? We we have it, and in fact, I was here. Uh, when we had a much smaller group giving, uh, you know, and I was just saying when I got appointed three years ago, we had approval of having in-tax, and I was speaking last year without having in-tax, and I just, you kept on saying, yes, you were getting it, yes, you were getting it, but uh, there's not enough uh, pressure, and we have to keep on doing it. And after two and a half years, I've got, we've got our in-tax. So I think, yeah, I totally agree that that's, that's the way to go. But I've not said that. <laughs> I've been recorded as well. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Okay. Uh, um, just, just a uh, very, very broad facts about graph that corneal transplants, um, unfortunately, take a while to get better. So it's not like cataract surgery, unfortunately. It does take a while. Some patients get, in six weeks' time, quite good improvement. But that's very rare. Usually, I would say it can take a mean of six to eight months before the quality improves. You can manipulate the sutures. You can think about getting glasses or contact lenses to have a good quality vision. Um, and because it's a corneal transplant, uh, it's a donor tissue, you may have to be on uh, immunosuppression, uh, whether it's topical or uh, systemic depends on um, um, you know what what the coexistent if, it, if it's an only keratoconus usually you usually can get away with only topical drops um, the, so, some other facts where um, the graft rejection still I must say compared to any other graft in the body we are quite immune privileged and the keratoconus is the best indication with the graft rejection is um, still very uncommon. But you still have the suture issue. Unfortunately, there is suturing. If it, if it gets loose, or if if there's if it if there is blood vessels attracting towards it, or if there's any inflammation around which can attract inflammation, can start off rejection. Unfortunately, and hence there's still 11 to 18 percent who will need um, uh, graft who will have graft rejection and treatment for that. Fortunately, it's very easily reversible, uh, but uh, the, the earlier you identify, the better, better the results are. This is quite a typical um, sign of corneal graft rejection, uh, where you get uh, an immune uh, response, and can't get it. Basically, you get a line of um, inflammatory deposits. Uh, it was first identified by Kuda dose. And uh, it's, uh, which, which is usually uh, a sign of corneal graft rejection on the endothelium. What do you feel? You will feel pain, photophobia, um, blurred vision. The, 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 these are the, from your point of view, pain, photophobia, blurred vision, which is new. If you've got a graft, you should come to our class. Should be as simple as that. You should not. If one eye has got corneal graft, the other eye has a bit of a pain and a bit of grittiness, a bit of discharge, no problem. This eye, if this has had a graft, pain, photophobia, blurred vision, wherever you are, go to eye casualty rather than going anywhere else. Because you may have rejection, you may have rejection which can easily be sorted in 48 hours, but the longer you leave, unfortunately, the more chances of endothelial damage and more chances of irreversible damage to the corneal graft. Um, as I say, some people, if they've got a regraft or if they've got atopic disease or if they've got other uh, eczema, I have quite a few, uh, few patients who uh, unfortunately have very, very vascularized cornea, even with keratoconus because of uh, previous contact lens wear, and they've got eczema. They have to be on up to six to eight months of systemic steroids, which is not very nice because it does you know, put on weight and you have other side effects, um, and you, you may have to be on other more immune suppression like tactrolimus and cyclophosphamide. So unfortunately, that, that is a big deal for, for that six months because the quality of life gets 
quite significantly affected. Um, causes of graft failure rejection still are the highest, um, it comes as highest. Um, because you're using topical steroids, because you're using, um, you, you can have coexisting glaucoma or glaucoma induced as a result of graft and its topical medication, glaucoma, is also a uh, reason for failure of the graft. Infection and endothelial failure uh, is another cause. Um, I think that's probably what I wanted to cover, I think. Um, when we talk about uh, astigmatism, about corneal transplant surgery, that's really uh, more into detail about how to manage a corpus graft. And I think every, that's why I think everybody should be of the opinion that even if you get a corneal transplant, it's not the end to wearing glasses or contact lenses, unfortunately, because you still get a bit of an am amotropia. It could be myopia, it could be astigmatism. Unfortunately, it's the way the edge of the graft heals it cannot be controlled and sometimes you're almost without glasses before you take the stitches out and you uh, take the stitches out at the end of the year and the graft heals in such a way that you've got about five doctors of astigmatism and you think, why did he take my stitches out? So um, uh, that, that bit is not easy unfortunately and hence uh, everybody has to have a practical expectation and hence the drive from surgeon's point of view is to delay or you know not delay as such for the coronary transplant but, um, you know, find, find other less interventional one like collagen prospecting, like Intax, and uh, uh, use an adjuvant with uh, the newer variety of contact lenses before you encroach up to uh, coronary transplant. Thanks very much.